functional architecture. So if we could have uh, everyone's attention, please. Thank you. Take it away, Jim. G'day. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, so I'm here to talk about architecture um, and sort of uh, essentially want to start with the idea that functional programming has, has many benefits. Right? There are many reasons why we use it. Um, we can get better reasonability about our programs, so we can reason about them. We can compose programs together. Um, we can ref refactor them fearlessly. Um, and we can actually get be some better performance uh, understanding of our programs. Right? Um, but unfortunately, the dominant way we write our systems is still rooted in this idea of, um, of mutation and changing things. Right? Um, but the ideas of functional programming have been used very successfully for a long time uh, to deliver architectures that solve significant problems such as um, security, concurrency, uh, auditing and distribution. Right? Mostly in the world of, of systems programming, so things like databases, um, file systems, etc. Right? But we can actually use them now uh, as application programmers to build, to use these techniques to build better and more reliable systems that are easy to reason about and we get significant practical advantages from doing so. Okay. The th I want to talk about complexity first. Um, so complexity is something that makes our software difficult to understand. Right? It makes it difficult to debug, test, um, and also to learn, right? and, and also to, and even to use. Right? The more complex our software is, this is a, a, a definite worserer of uh, you know, a measure for our software. We want to avoid complexity at all costs. Um, so what does complexity actually mean? There are many aspects and measures of complexity. Um, and most of them that we generally know are related to aspects of the actual source itself. So things like uh, too many dependencies or too many interdependencies, cyclomatic complexity, too many if statements, etc. Um, right? And these are really related to how the code is expressed. Right? But another really important one is actually understanding what software does. How do, how do we actually understand what are the, the effects that software has and how do, they, how do they actually work? How do we actually um, debug and understand these things? Right. And there are significant problems when we have side effects where we need to understand how these side effects will actually compose together. Um, and this actually creates a real problem for combining software together. If we have software that has side effects, then we need to understand what those software side effects are and how they actually interrelate to each other before we can actually compose things together. Right. So um, complexity really starts to interfere with the, um, the ability to compose stuff. Right. Uh, can we compose things that are complex uh, without introducing more complexity? Right. So the general idea of composability is that we can compose two things together and we haven't introduced additional complexity simply by the composition. Right. And side effects generally don't compose. Right. Um, so if we can avoid having side effects, then uh, we don't need to worry about things like how many times something was called, right? Um, what were the order of the things that were uh, the side effects applied? Right? Was there any outside interference? Did somebody else perform a side effect on the thing that we're performing a side effect on? So if another person wrote to a file while we're writing to it, we end up with garbled contents. Right? Um, and Tony already talked about referential transparency. Side effects really mean the absence of referential transparency. Right? And referential transparency is a really important thing to us as functional programmers. And if we have them, then we don't, by definition, have referential transparency. So this is a bad thing. Okay. So we've talked a lot about 
kind of um, you know, functional programming today, we haven't really provided a definition, so I'm going to provide what I think is a minimal definition of functional programming. So functional programming is really just programming with functions, okay? <laughs> Which is funny, but what is actually a function, right? A function, say f from a to b, right, relates a value of type a, i.e. in the domain a, to exactly one value from its uh, codomain b, right? And importantly, the same input value will always produce the same output value, okay? So on Tuesdays, it can't produce another one. We can't kind of say, well, you know, I think something about this, um, you know, there's some race condition or anything else. I, it must relate one value of A to one value of B, right? And it can do nothing else, right? So it can't write to files, it can't throw exceptions, it can't um, do all of the other things that, that Tony talked about previously. So really if we think about this, we're having values to values. So maybe it's not programming with functions, maybe it's programming with values. Okay, so what is a value? Well, a value is a thing that cannot change. The number three is a value. Right? We can't change three and say, oh, well, now it's four, or you know, I can't give it to you and then mutate it or something. Right? And these have lots of benefits. Right? Values uh, can be shared. They can be used as keys. Um, they can, you know, if I share something with somebody, I, I, I can't change it out from underneath them. Right? Um, and so simple things like ints and strings and so on are values, but also a function itself is a value. As long as I can give you a function and you can then use that function. Right? And referentially transparent expressions are themselves values. So values are extremely important. They're things that cannot change. Right? And the state of a thing in time is a value. So um, what I was wearing yesterday, um, you know, what the value of a particular issue might have been yesterday. I changed the issue, I now have a new value. Okay. What about identity? Let's think about identity for a second. What is identity? Well, identity is essentially the things around us. I'm an identity, you are an identity, right? Uh, a river, a mountain. These are things that you know, persist over time, right? And they're things that we give names to, right? Mount Kosciuszko, the River Murray, right? And importantly, in terms of our sort of way that we think about, uh, about the world, we think about things in terms of identities. Right, that's my car, right? um, I, that's my mum, that's my dad, etc. Right, so they're the objects in our world. Um, and really, if we think about, that's kind of been the dominant philosophy of the way that we think about, about things. So Socrates persists over time, gets sick, but is still Socrates. Right, so these are the, the persistent things and, um, and object-oriented ideas come from this kind of notion of, um, or this philosophical basis, that we have things that we name that persist over time, that change. But back in the same day as Socrates and Aristotle, there was another person called Heraclitus. And he kind of, had this idea, well, nobody ever crosses the same river twice, right? because the river's changed, right? and you've changed. So this idea was really gives us, comes to this kind of notion of uh, an identity as a series of values over time. Right? So a river 
has different values of water carrying over time. And a person has a different set of states over time. What I was wearing yesterday was what I was wearing yesterday. I can't change it. Right? That is the state that I was yesterday. This is a very different philosophical kind of idea and it underpins a lot of the idea of functional programming. The, this idea that we have things that are uh, existent um, over time at particular values. Okay, so what does this mean for programming? Well, this is really kind of common standard, you know, programming 101. Right? Everyone understands this, right? Well, I reckon this is nonsense. And in fact, anybody except programmers will tell you this is nonsense. But as programmers, we go, okay, well, x equals x plus 1, of course. Mathematician will just say, false. Right? This <laughs> does not... <laughs> Right. It makes no sense at all. And really, if we think about it, what we are expressing here is a low-level execution plan for a program, for the way that things work on von Neumann architectures. Right. Um, but is it really how we should write programs? Is this kind of the way that we want to? I'd say, well, if you're writing you know, a, a virtual machine, or a, you know, something like that, a JIT compiler or a hotspot or something like that. Well, maybe you need to understand this, but as programmers, do we really want to write programs like this? Um, at high levels of abstraction, I don't think it makes any sense. We want to make, we want to make statements that are not fundamentally false. <laughs> right? And if we don't want to write our programs like that, then why would we design our systems using the same fundamental kind of um, abstraction or idea? Okay, so what's really wrong with it? Okay, we only have one value for x. What is x? Right? But if we know that, then we don't know what it was. Right? Or if maybe we knew what it was, but we don't now know what it is, because something happened to it and Really, what we've done is we've, that x is ephemeral. We've lost something. We've, we've actually thrown away something that's really important. Okay. And x here, of course, is a name. Right? So it's an identity, and it carries over time. But we've now just said, okay, well, we're only going to look at the, uh, you know, the superficial value of x and not know what it was. Right? But this is exactly how most of our um, actual storage systems work. So if we're going to, say, update a person record, we go and update it and you know, set some value to it. Right. Same if we write to a file. We just start writing to the file named foo.txt and who knows what it used to be. Right. But this is not something that is necessarily uh, you know, the only way it has to be. Right. And in fact, for a long time, this is uh, in things outside of computing, this was not the case. For instance, accountants don't use erasers. Right. If you're going to change things, you actually write out a ledger. Right. So this gives us an idea about how we can actually affect change without doing mutation. Right. We essentially have a series of values over time, right? and we're modeling an entity as a series of events as they happen. Right? And there's a name for this, it's known as append-only computing or log-structured. Right? And these days it's fairly commonly uh, known as event sourcing. So let's have a look at a quick example. I'm using Haskell here simply because it can, allows me to fit things on a slide. Right? <laughs> OK, so um, I don't know if we've seen one of these before. This is um, a, a data called event, and it's, um, Ken used the word, algebra. It's an algebraic data structure, which simply means it can only be a closed algebra of cases, and they can be, uh, so we have two type variables, k and, k and v. Um, it could be a create, so we can create something for a key 
with a value, an update where we update a key to a new value, or a delete where we delete that key. Okay? If, if anyone has any questions, please. No. So, um, we also have a simple definition of a person. A person has two attributes, a name, and some map of attributes. This is not all the Haskell programmers are glaring at me at the moment. Um, this is not very type safe, but we'll do for our example. Um, and just quickly, so that we know, um, introducing these things creates constructors. So, person, uh, this here I've defined a function which takes a string and uh, a map and produces a person. And we can see that this is basically just a, um, an alias for the constructor that Haskell will give us automatically. Okay, so person name atra is how I construct a person. Right. The last thing we need is this very simplified version of foldable where I can fold, and in this case we have um, given a B, a value of type B, and a value of type A, produce a new B. So this is a function. I give it a function which takes a B and an A and produces a B. A B, which is a seed value, right? And my foldable of A's, so some things, say a list of A's, right? I want to then produce a final value of B. Does that make sense? If anyone has questions, please put your hand up. Okay. All right, so then I can also have some source of events. Uh, in this case, my events are um, keyed by int, and they contain people as the value, or person as the value. Right, so I'm going to create uh, at ID 1 a person, uh, Alice, and I'm going to create at ID 2 a person, Bob, with no attributes. But then I'm going to update Alice, give um, a, a basic sort of age attribute, and uh, give Bob a phone attribute. Then I'm going to update Alice again and uh, give her a phone number and then delete two. Okay, so this is a, um, an event source of people. Right? And in this case, I've just made it a list because it's an example. Okay, so remember that we can fold using that. Let's have a look at a way of extracting Alice's events from this. We simply say, given um, some foldable of events that happens to contain um, ints and uh, int keyed people, then maybe we can produce a person. Okay, and in this case, Alice takes a uh, our events stream, and it says fold on that, and we're going to take a function called only Alice, and we're going to seed it with nothing. So our seed value says, well, I haven't got anything to start with, um, and I'm going to feed the events in as the thing, and only Alice is implemented as um, if I get um, a, a, a maybe as my B value, as my initial value, then, um, and the event here is keyed with one, okay, so I'm only interested in the key one, then take that person, and then I remove that, and I just return that person. So each time it goes through, I'm just taking the last person that I found, and then if I didn't match, so this is just pattern matching, then I just return whatever the, the original value was. Okay? Um, now, quickly have a look. This is a, a um, generalized version of it. People were asking before about whether um, you know, how much the generalization and abstraction helps. In this case, I've just generalized it, so in, it says I just need some way of comparing keys, and given a key, then I can produce, and some um, foldable of events, then produce some maybe value. Um, I've not got a lot of time to go through that, so, so that's, we'll just go through and Okay, so given our source of events, right, then we can produce the current version of that value. Um, additionally, if we add the ability to persist that current version of a value, then we can continuously feed new, version, new events as they come in into our event source and produce this new kind of 
current version. So effectively we get the ability to sort of mutate. Right? And we can then persist this new version. Right? And importantly, what we've done is we've now decoupled the source of the data, which is our event stream, and the actual representation, the current state. And we can put that current state into any type of storage that we want for a particular um, thing. So say, for instance, we want uh, to be able to do full text searches on um, their bio attributes, or it doesn't really matter what it is, we can use it for, say, query optimized storage or whatever. Right. And we can, don't need to store events as uh, fully realized values. We can store them as, as sort of patches or updates. Um, and we can also store things like derived facts. We can work things out. Um, and we could, for instance, store a complete value if we're only doing patches. So we don't need to read through from the beginning to derive a current state. Right. Um, and this fits really well with command query request separation where we have servers that handle commands and then separate out our query servers so we can um, basically tailor the uh, deployment pattern for those things. Okay, so content addressable storage. Um, with content addressable storage, we store uh, content at a at derived hash from that content. So for instance, a SHA-1 hash, right? Then we associate a name with that hash. So the name foo.txt is currently ABCD. Um, and when we want to retrieve foo.txt, we just say what hash is foo.txt currently at, and then it says ABCDE, and we go and say, well, give me content for ABCDE. Right. And if we update something, then we're simply adding new content and reassociating the hash. Right. And if we cache, we only cache things at hash, so we don't need to worry about uh, cache eviction strategies because we're always re-looking up the, the name. Um, address generation is entirely distributable and, um, and all additions commute. So it doesn't matter if you and I both put in the same uh, content into this, the store, it both goes, they both go to the same hash. Right? So we don't have to worry about um, interfering with each other. We only need to worry about interfering with names and the association to a particular hash. And of course, our address is a checksum, so it gives us automatic um, content verification. So Git, turns out Git really um, uses this idea, right? So it is obviously a distributed version control system, right? And it gives us cryptographic authentication of the entire history. And it does all of this simply by using um, a content addressable storage for all content, right, where all the blobs are stored using the content hash. And we have a content which is a tree which lists things like the, uh, the names of these things and their parents. Um, and yeah, commits are always stored using uh, the SHA, the hash of those, those things. So roughly it looks like this. So down the bottom we have our original commit. Um, the next commit above it refers back to that commit as part of its content. So if we were to change that tree uh, value in there, it would, um, it would actually change the, tr the hash of the tree itself. Okay, so this gives us uh, a complete cryptographic um, history that cannot be changed. Okay, so updates add new files. Um, all old versions are reconstructable, right? The same content always produces the same hash. Um, and this is an almost completely immutable data structure. The only difference is that if we have a name of a branch, that is mutated to point to a particular hash. Okay. Right. So in this sense, we can see that the file system is a mutable view of that immutable data structure. Right. And it's, we can reconstruct it at any point in time. Um, right, we've talked about that. Um, and because of these things, we're easily able to share these things between distributed, non-connected um, repositories. Right. Um, okay, and we can use some kind of mis uh, merge strategy to resolve conflicts, and that gives us a distributed 
acyclic graph. Um, okay, so briefly, because I'm running out of time, we've used this to build a, a large distributed file uh, storage system um, where we use exactly these kinds of techniques. Um, it allows us to do things like conditional updates using, say, an e-tag, which is the, the, um, the hash of the content. Um, it gives us lots of advantages in terms of operation because we can back up only the events uh, that changed, um, the event stream being the, the name to content associations. And we only need to back up current content which is not currently in our, in our backup. All right, so in conclusion, all of these, um, a lot of these ideas that we've been using for the last sort of 10, 20 years, 30 years, are based around uh, restrictions that are no longer relevant. Right? In the old world, we had you know, very expensive single machines, right? and um, they did not have a lot of resources. These days, we have basically um, unlimited storage, unlimited and massive distribution of computing. Right? These techniques have been used in systems programming for a long time, but they are now practically available to us as application programmers. Okay? But what we really need now is to make these sort of easy and normal and intuitive, and that's the great challenge that we have before us. Thank you. Um, this paper and this uh, talk by Pat Helen um, is fantastic. He uh, works at Salesforce now, used to work uh, for, uh, actually, uh, I've forgotten for a second, but he worked, um, it's a lot of the ideas that I uh, talked about here, he expounds on in great detail, so. Um, yeah, so the, to paraphrase the question, um, there always seems to be like, you know, you're going down a rabbit hole and there's always uh, a further place, at which point you go, aha, mutation, um, I'll grab that because that's, that's my solution. It is definitely the case that we as a programming uh, core have had, you know, many thousands and millions of years of, um, of practice doing sort of imperative uh, mutation programming and nowhere near as much as, as functional programmers. So I think the techniques for um, how do we kind of make those um, uh, you know, not reach for, for mutation so early, because sometimes you need uh, mutation, um, then yeah, that like we get better at, at doing that. Um, and then there are also things that allow us to um, uh, to get things like a, a stable identifier. So uh, if we're talking about, say, an, an identifier, we could use a GUID, which is a random value, which is, so therefore it's a, it's a mutation, but it, um, we could also use something like the hash of um, the initial content or something like that. But often not necessarily um, the right way to do it, but we have options. Um, and yeah, the, um, I think, as we get uh, more experienced, we, we discover that there are, there are techniques that can give us better um, uh, answers for some of these things. How are we going? We're done. We're done? All right. Cool. Thanks very much, everyone.